The Dilbert Principle. Leadership is nature's way of removing morons from the productive flow. With us today, the man behind the Dilbert Principle, for that matter, the man behind Dilbert itself, cartoonist, author, and it turns out political philosopher, Scott Adams. Uncommon knowledge, now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Raised in a small town in upstate New York, Scott Adams graduated from Hartwick College in 1979. He worked for a number of years for the Crocker National Bank in San Francisco, earned an MBA at the University of California at Berkeley, and then went to work for another number of years at Pacific Bell, a period during which he began getting up early each morning to draw cartoon strips. By the middle of the 1990s, Mr. Adams had at last become a full-time cartoonist and the name of that cartoon strip is Dilbert. Today, Dilbert appears in thousands of newspapers in more than 50 countries and in more than a dozen languages. Mr. Adams is the author of the best-selling book, The Dilbert Principle, of many collections of his cartoons, and most recently, of how to fail at almost everything and still win big. Subtitle, kind of the story of my life. Recently, Mr. Adams has also attracted attention for his blog, where he has been offering advice to his fellow Americans on how to think about President Trump and advice to President Trump on how to think about America. Scott Adams, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Let's get this out of the way right away. All right. You and Donald Trump. President Trump's approval ratings are the lowest on record and among <laughs> academics and journalists and for sure professional people here in Northern California, he is almost universally derided. But here's you on your blog, quote, Trump doesn't have one talent that is best in the world, but he does have one of the best talent stacks I have ever seen, close quote. Okay, so what's a talent stack? And then tell us about Donald Trump. Well, first of all, let me, let me clarify that when I uh, talk about Trump, I'm talking about it through a persuasion filter. In other words, I have a background as a hypnotist. I'm a trained hypnotist, and I've been so studying... My eyelids are growing heavy even now. <laughs> uh, and I have studied persuasion in all of its forms as part of what I do as a, as a writer and cartoonist. And I noticed in uh, candidate Trump at first a, a type of persuasive skill that you just don't see. Yeah, he brought the full package of persuasion. And if you're, not, if you're not a student of it, you would miss it entirely. In other words, if you didn't know anything about the techniques he was using, you would say, what's this crazy, random, chaotic clown who keeps doing things? Hey, he won again. He won the primary. Well, that was luck. Um, but he'll never win the, uh-oh, what just happened? So I, I predicted all of this, I think, a year and a half before Election Day. And I predicted that he would win by a lot. Now. You could argue whether the Electoral College victory was a lot, and you could argue about the, uh, you know, the popular vote. But the fact is he played a game that had a set of rules, and he won by a lot uh, on the game he was playing, which was the Electoral College. Yes. He didn't win the game he wasn't playing, but I kind of assumed that didn't matter, and it didn't. Um, so when I talk about his talent stack, that's a little bit uh, of some... Uh, some thinking from my book that you just mentioned. And the idea is Let's sell that, a few copies. It's a wonderful <laughs> book. Thank you. Uh, there are two basic ways to really make a difference in this world and succeed. And here, success is not just financial, but just success in life. One way is to be insanely good at one thing. Let's say Tiger Woods, you know, right. he's good at one thing. But you really have to be about one of the best in the world, depending on the thing you're doing, to really make a dent, all right? But the other way you can do it is the way that I've done it, which is I've compiled a, a set of complementary skills, and I'm not really the best in the world at anything, right? So uh, if you were to go into you know, any crowded room, you could find a better artist than me. It would be easy, because I, I just don't have much artistic skill. For the skill. sake of argument, I'll let you be self-denigrating, but go ahead. Well, I think anybody who studies cartoons would look at the page and say, well, there's the worst artist on the page. So, yeah, there's no, no false right. humility involved right. in any of that. Um, I've never taken a writing course, but I know how to make short, pithy sentences, so I'm you know, good at that. 
I have a lot of business experience because I, for 16 years, I worked in the corporate world. So I had something to draw upon, which is, you know, the fodder for this trip. Um, and you could go down the line of, you know, what it takes to be a cartoonist, business skills, for example. You know, I, I have my MBA from, from Cal. And those things all just work together really well, but I'm not great at any of them. I'm not, I'm not Warren Buffett, my business skills, but I have enough to do this thing. And they, they just work together well. Now, so this lovely image of a, you stack this talent on this talent on this talent on this talent, and you end up with something that's pretty impressive. Right. And then the trick is that they have to be complementary skills. Right. So being able to uh, be a, a speaker, being comfortable in this kind of format, uh, works really well with being a writer. You know, if you, ha if you have only the writing skills, well, where are you going to promote your book? Right. So they just work well together. Now, back to Donald Trump. If you look at the things he can do better than most people, he can definitely give a speech better than most people, but the experts will say, ah, look at the... He's no John Kennedy. Yeah, he's, he's no, no John Ronald Kennedy. Reagan. Where's his, where's his soaring rhetoric right. you know, and all that? Well, he doesn't have that, but the crowd loves him. He's funny, all right? And it's hard to be funny, and funny really helps your popularity, helps your persuasion. And again, he's not a stand-up comedian funny, but if you put him in a room, he would be one of the top 20% funny people in a room, right? Right. Um, he's smart, not the smartest person in the world. You know, he's not, he's not the physicist who's gonna solve uh, you know, the next great problem in physics, but he's clearly smarter than most people, right? Unambiguously, he's smarter than most people. He knows enough about government um, and how it works from the other side, because he dealt with it a lot, right. that he, was no expert in government, but he knew mo more than somebody who wasn't involved in any way, right? Right. He knew about being a boss, he knew about leadership, he knew about, uh, he knew about entering a field that he'd never entered before, because he'd done it a number of times, which, by the way, is usually a tell for a, what I call a master persuader, someone who knows persuasion and also has built a talent stack that can take them in a lot of different directions. That's so he goes from Queens to Manhattan, he goes from building to casinos, he goes from casinos to branding, personal, uh, branding various items and entities, and then he goes to becoming a television personality. Those are really quite distinct career patterns. And then president of the United States. And before that, candidate, a whole different job. Right. Like the job of candidate is pretty different. This guy's done a lot. Job. And not only did he do those things, but he almost entered at the top, <laughs> you know? Uh, he, he was so strong going in that they had just had the whole package. Now, the other thing he has, which is a big deal, is that he brought the whole Donald Trump persona, right? So that allowed him, for example, to be largely immune from scandals that would pop up. Because you knew that at some point during the, the, <laughs> the election, somebody would say, what about that thing you did with this or that woman? You knew that was going to happen, right? And sure enough, the in the uh, the tapes that we that we all heard uh, showed that. But he was somewhat immune from that because he he started from the beginning. He said, "I'm no angel," and his divorce with uh, from Ivana was on the front page of the New York Post day after day for weeks back in the when it, whatever it was early '90s. Nobody knew he. Nobody thought of him as a choir boy. He was smart enough never to make a big deal about you know I'm your family role model, right. never sold himself that way, so he was never vulnerable to those attacks in the way that regular people would be. The other thing he has, and, and I think this comes with learning persuasion, is that he has the thickest skin. You know, he's accused of being exactly the opposite because he always attacks back, and I'll, I can talk about that specifically. But imagine the amount of abuse that he clearly knew was going to come his way just by running. And then by winning, it you know, gets that much worse. So he, he signed up for that. You, know, you don't do that unless you, you've got a thick skin. And look at the stuff he's brushed off you know, so far. It's, it's really impressive. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there you are during the presidential campaign, and you start blogging. And I have to say, this is, it gets my attention. Why would a guy who's a cartoonist have such fresh insight? Okay, so I'm looking at it. But... You're putting a distance between yourself, often or quite a wry distance between yourself and Donald Trump. You said his policies weren't necessarily your policies. You're quite cagey about it all the time. Well, uh, let, let me let me go ahead, to you there because I'm trying to figure out where I want to know where you stand, and you may not let me ask okay. that. But, but go, go ahead. No, I'm uh, I'm going to volunteer that. 
Socially, I call myself an ultra liberal, meaning right. that I'm more liberal than liberals. All right. So you couldn't get further from you know the Republican stand that I am. And I'll give you an example. Uh, a normal uh, liberal would say, um, you know, drugs should be maybe more legalized. I say that if you're over 50, your doctor should be giving them to you. Because <laughs> you know? yeah. really, <laughs> growing old sucks. <laughs> and if you if you're 80. You should get LSD. You should, you know, you should get, you should get mushrooms. Whatever it takes, you know, to, to make you happy. So wherever the liberal position is, I'm quite often even further to the left on that. Right. I'll give you another example. Um, conservatives might want to ban abortion. Liberals might want to say we would like that option. I go further to the left and say, men, stay out of it. Right? Whatever the women figure out for how this reproductive right should be. How about we listen to them, who clearly know everything we know about, you know, meaning men, about you know the science and the, mm -hmm, the details mm -hmm. and the politics, but they have the extra appreciation and more importantly, the extra responsibility. They take the responsibility of reproduction that men can't take, mm -hmm. right? And in general, when people take on more responsibility, society often says, we'll give you a little extra rights, a little consideration because you're doing something that's so important. So I say on abortion, men should listen, and whatever women collectively agree with, I'm okay with that, wherever that goes. So you can't get more right. left than that. Right. So back to your point, uh, uh, and on, on stuff like international relations, what do we do with trade deals and stuff like that, my, my view is always the same. I don't know. <laughs> this stuff is way too complicated for an average voter to figure out you know, what to do with the TPP, and you know, we, we don't know. So. You did. I found this quotation because I thought to myself, I've got him. Let's see if I have got you. Trump's value proposition is, this is you on your blog, quote, Trump's value proposition is that he will make America great. That concept sounds appealing to me. The nation needs good brand management. Okay, so whatever else is going on, issue by issue by issue, you look at this guy and say, you know, he's my guy. Well, I'm not saying I'd say my guy. I say that he has a set of skills which are extraordinary. And the thing I was most interested in was that the country could see it clearly without the filter put on it by the opposition. Right. Because right? they're both painting each other terribly. In Hillary Clinton's um, situation, people know what a standard politician is, right? So that, you know, y y they could see through the attacks on the other side. We knew what we were getting. Right. But with Trump, people didn't know what they were getting. Uh, at least half the country thought he was crazy Hiller. Right? And um, I had actually predicted, I guess before he was inaugurated, that you would see the following story arc develop. Because it just was obvious if, you've, if you're trained in persuasion, it was gonna go this way. It would start with, oh my God, we've accidentally elected Hiller. Like, how did this happen? How did half the country or so not know that we've elected a monster? And I, I figured, okay, after a few months of not doing Hitler stuff, it's just gonna sort of dissipate. And it has, right? Right. So by summer I said, that the Hitler thing will dissipate, and it did, um, but it would be replaced with, but he's incompetent. He's incompetent, right. he's competent. And sure enough, that was the big word of the this, this summer up till, you know, up till now. Uh, I didn't see the Russia thing coming, because that, you know, that's, that's hard to predict. Right. Um, but I've predicted that after the uh, he's incompetent phase will come the, well, he did get a lot done, but we don't all like that. You know, he did things we don't like, but he was awfully effective. And he did do the things he said he was going to do. We just don't like those things. So you're going to see that by year end. And in fact, you're already seeing the, yes. the turn. It's, it's pretty, uh, it's visible now. You can right. see the turn happen. Right. I, I want to return to Donald Trump and current politics in a moment, but... <clears throat> how to fail at almost everything and still win big, kind of the story of my life, is a book that combines a fascinating life story with insights from a fascinating mind and also lovely light touch with the prose. It is so readable. A couple of moments from the book, and I'm just, I just want to give a flavor of Scott Adams and the way his mind works. We have a very young Scott Adams dressed in a cheap three-piece suit seated on an airplane to California next to a businessman and learning 
I'm quoting from the book, quote, goals are for losers, <laughs> close quote. Get, how do we get to that scene and how did you learn that lesson in that moment? Well, let me, let me finish that story of the airplane and then I'll extend that to systems versus goals. So the, the person I chanced upon meeting uh, struck up a conversation with me and part of the reason was because I was wearing a suit on an airplane and I was you know, 21, I guess. And you thought people dressed to go on airplanes? I'd never been on an airplane. I'd never been on one and I didn't know many people who had been. That's how small my town was and how small my experience was. Uh, and I also didn't know how to pack it, so I thought, well, I'll just wear it. It won't get right. wrinkled when I go right. there. <laughs> and this, this gentleman I'm sitting next to started a conversation, and he told me about his system for life. That the moment he would get a job, you know, ideally a promotion, he would immediately start looking for his next job. So his concept of what his career looked like was not a goal, as in, I will get this job. It was a system where he never had the job he was going to keep. You know, his system was that you're always, you're always looking for the next job, and it's a better job. And I extended that in the book, and it's sort of my, um, my philosophy of life, is, is I look for a system instead of a goal. Now, I could give, would you like to hear the advantages? I would, I would well, first of all, I want to make sure that, I, th I think I got it because I read the book, but I want to tease it out a little bit. So a goal is some, the goal is the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. A system is something you do every day. It is a method. It is a means of approaching. Have I got that? That's the basic distinction. Yeah, so, okay, so, so, far, right. so go ahead. So for example, um, getting a specific job or promotion would be a goal, but going to college would be a system because you're doing it, you know, the whole time you're there, you're working on it, but you don't know exactly where it's going to go. Right. But you know your odds just got a lot better. Right. In a whole bunch of different ways. Right. So any good system has that quality. You're doing it regularly and it increases your odds. So I extend that to fitness and, uh, and uh, diet and, uh, and jobs as well. So the talent stack is a system. So if you say to yourself, well, I've got these skills and maybe you've got some natural ability. You know, there's something about you that it would be hard for people to, to equal. You're just born that way. You've got the gift of gab. You're, you're handsome. You're whatever you are. And you say, well, what goes well with that? And mm. then you build a system of learning those things and, and adding to the stack. So that would be one system. And there are different systems for exercise and diet, et cetera. Okay. I just thought this entered my head. Coach Bilicek, coach of the Patriots, execute the plays and the score will take care of itself. That's exactly <laughs> the same point you're making, isn't it? Well, to the extent... The trouble is that football is such a constrained, yes, man-made yes, thing right. that nothing really translates from Right, that. right. It's all... Okay. Um, here's another moment. Uh, you're working for years at a bank, and then you're working for years at a telephone company, and then all of a sudden, you're the one of the most famous cartoonists in America. <laughs> so how did that happen? And the lesson here, again, I'm quoting from the book, is luck can be managed, sort of. Yeah. How did you manage those years? This, what was it, 14 years, I think, in corporate America? Yeah, 16. 16. Yeah. Well, when I say luck can be managed, I, I mean this. Um, if you wanted to be hit by lightning, let's, let's just say that was something you wanted, um, you know, most people would say, well, it's very unusual to be hit by lightning, right? right? So it's just luck. There's nothing you can do about it. But I would say there very much is something you can do about it. You can go outdoors. That would increase your odds. You could go outdoors when it's raining in a place that has thunderstorms. That would increase your odds. And if that's not enough, sell all your possessions, move to the top of a mountain that has frequent thunderstorms, build a network of connected lightning rods, and camp out with your hand on one. You're going to get hit by some freaking lightning, right? <laughs> so, so when you say, you know, I, I don't know what to do. I'm not lucky. You know, lucky I find you. You can go find luck. Right? The first thing I did when I got out of college, in my you know small upstate New York life, is I said, where is all the luck? You know, and, and I was thinking opportunity, but right. really they're they're right. so so correlated. And I said, I got to get out of here. And I I said California. And Which I leads to the, in, the, and, three, the three piece suit in the airplane. Right? Yeah, and I ended up in, I, I actually um, traded my car to my sister for a one way ticket to California. Really? Okay. Again, and this is, going to, this is going to lead me from the book to current politics, but I'll let you, uh, I, I don't want to reveal just how at, at the moment. 
I'm quoting from How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Big. Quote, I ignored my father's advice to work for the Postal Service. I got into college without much help from my guidance counselor, and I stayed in school against my doctor's advice. You had mono, and the doctor said you should drop out. You stayed in school. This was about the time that my opinion of experts and authority figures in general began a steady descent that continues to this day. I think I see another reason you like Donald Trump. You're subversive. You don't like being told what to do or looking up to anybody. You know, and part of it is life experience. The older you get, the more um, examples you see of, hey, you remember that food pyramid that we're all taught as a kid? Turns out there was no science to that. Hey, what about those vitamins you take, your one a day vitamin? That's been tested, right? Not really, there's no reason you take it one, once a day. All those vitamins and minerals should be delivered in different doses in different ways. And by the way, we haven't even studied most of them. You know, how about those eight, eight uh, glasses of water you were supposed to drink or something? Turns out, no science to that. What about the uh, don't go swimming, you know? Uh, after within, you eat? After you eat. Turns out, no science to that. So you can go, you know, the older you are, the more of these you've seen, the less your respect for the experts, uh, you know, can be maintained. Okay, so now this takes us right to the issues of the day. And on your blog, you have what are, to me at least, completely novel ways of looking at a number of issues about which I, because of the nature of my work at a think tank, thought I had read and heard everything. <laughs> and here's one of them, climate change. Quote, it seems to me that a majority of experts could be wrong whenever you have a pattern that looks like this. There's a severe social or economic penalty for having the wrong, wrong in quotation marks, opinion in the field. I agree with the consensus of climate scientists because saying otherwise in public would be social and career suicide for me, <laughs> even as a cartoonist. Imagine how much worse the pressure would be if science was my career, close yeah. quote. Yeah, so so we know nothing about the science, you're just looking at the human psychology of the thing, right? Well, that's, that's uh, at least half of it, okay. the human psychology of it. So a lot of people who have not studied persuasion, for example, have never seen uh, mass delusions you know, explained to them in ways that just make your, your, your head explode. For example, a lot of people watching this have never heard of the McMartin school case. Right. Where a whole bunch of kids allegedly said that they'd all been you know, molested. Back by in the, the 80s, as I recall. I think so, right? Late 80s, early 90s, okay. So, so had all these people who had similar stories of molestation and satanic rituals and stuff, Apparently, and it turns out that all of it was false because it's easy to manipulate kids into telling stories because you act like you want them to, and then they just do. So there, there are lots of stories of mass delusion. So in my world, it is common, and the examples I gave you, the food pyramid, et cetera, it's common for all the experts to be on one side and still be wrong. To the average person, that seems unusual, right? But it's not unusual if you've, ex if you've expanded your, your scope and you've just looked for these things and you see it everywhere. Uh, I just, just, somebody just sent me an article of 43 peer-reviewed articles that were just removed from some publication because it turns out somebody was gaming the peer review system. But here's, here's the other part about climate, right. climate science. Whenever you see a big complicated projection model with lots of variables, and by the way, there's not just one of them, there are dozens of them, and the ones that didn't work, they throw away, and there's lots of judgment about, mm, we're gonna adjust these numbers. We have good reasons, we're telling everybody, you know, you can peer review it, right? but we're making some human decisions. And in that, in that situation, there's a level of complexity of these models that makes the likelihood that they're right you know, start to approach zero as right. the complexity you know, increases. Now, part of my perspective on that is that I used to do that. What, not, not what, with for the, the bank? Or what? Yeah, so for the bank, I would do financial projections based on all these variables and assumptions and everything. And I knew that I could give you any answer you wanted. I would ask my, my boss, how do you want this to come out? And then I would just sit there with my spreadsheet and put in numbers until it came out. And so that's my perspective. But if you haven't been through that world, if you haven't lived in right. the corporate world and seen how many experts were wrong, uh, let me give you the, the, the anecdote that just popped into my head. Uh, years ago, I worked in a lab in a phone company where we were testing cell phones. And somebody was trying to test if they would be dangerous you know, with the EMF or whatever it is right. holding up to you. So the top engineer 
studies it, he looks at everything and he concludes, no, there's no reason to be worried about holding these things up to your head. I talked to him privately and I said, all right, do you, do you believe that? Like, would you, would you hold the phone up to your head for hours at a time? And he said, no, no way. <laughs> and this was the expert whose report the entire company made their decision on. He said, no, I wouldn't do it. One more quotation from your blog. Well, still on climate science because it, I think it illuminates a certain amount about your approach. Quote, if you believe that experts are good at predicting future doom, you're probably scared to death about climate change. But any danger we humans see coming far in the future, we always find a way to fix. And then you note predictions of food scarcity. We haven't run out of food. Predictions we'd run out of oil. We have more energy than we know what to do with. Quote, I refer to this phenomenon as the Adam's law of slow moving disasters. Right. When we see a disaster coming, as we do with climate science, we have an unbroken track record of avoiding doom. If you ask me how scared I am of climate change is ruining the planet, I have to say it is near the bottom of my worries, close quote. Now, because I'm humane, I'm going to give you a chance to take that back right now. Uh, you live in Northern California, Scott. Now, uh, so most of you have uh, been following the news, and you saw that the Paris Climate Agreement uh, the United States back down. Trump takes us out of it, right? Right. And before that happened, I have to say, I thought that thing was probably pretty useful. Like, I, I thought, well, it's probably a bunch of really useful guidelines that would get us to, you know, at least reduce whatever this danger is. And by the way, I completely buy the idea that humans are heating up the, the, the right. earth. Um, but... So, so I'm buying that, and then the experts weigh in on how much difference it would have made if we'd stayed in. And it turns out, not really much of anything. It just wouldn't make much difference. I didn't know that. I actually thought, independent of the science, I thought that that agreement would make us do things that would change things. It turns out, not so much. What did all the experts tell us before we actually looked at that agreement, you know, in, mm -hmm. in, with some detail? They all said it's important, it's vital to the earth. Right. It's vital to the survival of the earth. All the experts were lined up on that. I mean, as much as they were lined up for climate science. Today, good luck finding somebody who can still defend that agreement, right. not, not talking and about the science. this is three weeks or a month or something yeah, like that. It's only been a month, and, and we've completely redefined what we thought was reasonable. Okay. Okay, so now we have established that you are a, you have a fascinating story. Wait, Go ahead. Can, can, I, can I just inject You do anything you want to. So my contribution, I think, to the conversation of climate science yes. is to break it into three categories and to, and to treat them with three separate probabilities, all right? Because we're, we're, all, we're all sort of guessing what are the odds that this is right. Right. The basic science part, the chemistry, the physics, if you add the CO2 in a closed system, will it heat up under these conditions? Probably is solid. Right. right. I'm not a scientist, but I would definitely believe the experts. Then there's the making the models part. Scientists are doing it. Other scientists are reviewing it. They're using sciencey things and logic and reason. I'm sure they're doing their best, but the odds of that being accurate are much lower. lower. And, and indeed, there have been lots of climate models in the past that, that were wrong. But the third part that doesn't get talked about is what I'd like to contribute to the conversation, which is the economic model. Right. Because the science doesn't tell you what to do, how hard to do it, or when to start. The science doesn't do that. The economic model says, okay, if you're gonna do something, it's gonna cost a lot of money, so you either start now or you, you hope you can wait till later. So for example, um, I, I added solar panels to my house when I built it, and I'll tie this to uh, climate change in a second. Uh, when I bought them, they said, if you get these solar panels, it'll pay itself off and lower, lower expenses in X years. That was true. You know, it looks like that, that actually is happening. Was it a good idea, economically, for me to get those solar panels? Seems like it, right? It paid off just like they said. No, it was a terrible economic idea. I, my background is economics right. as well. Because the cost of the installation dropped by probably 50% in a couple of years. So if I'd simply done nothing and waited for the technology to improve, I would have had a far better economic outcome. Likewise, with climate science, there's a lot happening that could be improvements in you know, green, this or that. Mm -hmm. um, I talked to an expert on uh, nuclear stuff, and he says fusion's actually almost solved. 
You know, really? Just, yeah. Okay. A- apparently, we're closer to just the engineering part than the science part. Got it. And uh, and these are enormous civilization changing, you know, developments. But there also could be developments in the next, say, five years of scrubbers, ways to take right. things out of the atmosphere, maybe a better understanding of how it's all happening, which gives us a new clue. So waiting is often the smartest thing you can do. Uh, take the year 2000 bug. Everybody said, hey, year 2000, the world's going to fall apart. And it looked like, you know, a year before that, we, we didn't really have much, you know, a, of a plan or a mechanism to fix it. But by the last few months, humans stepped up, geniuses got involved. I mean, I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't watching it closely, but you know, geniuses got involved. Right. And they, they probably built tools that allowed them to do a thing that they couldn't do quickly, quickly. Right. Right. So, so probably the same thing could happen in climate change. My point is, the, even if all the science stuff is exactly what the scientists say, and how would I know? I'm not a scientist. The economic part is, is just completely unfathomable. It's unpredictable by its nature. There has never been a, a good long-term economic model with lots of variables that worked out. Right. <laughs> it's, it's something that just hasn't been done. Right. Um, Back to the contemporary political slash cultural scene, let me ask you to give some advice to people who could use it. Here's a category. Republicans and conservatives who are having trouble with President Trump. Here's Bill Kristol. Quote, the problem isn't Trump's Twitter, the problem is Trump's character, close quote. Here's George Will. President Trump suffers from, quote, intellectual sloth and an untrained mind bereft of information and married to stratospheric self-confidence, close quote. People who are on his side to the extent that he lines up ideologically, who just can't, just are beside themselves. What's your advice? Advice for them or for? Yes, no, for them. Well, keep in mind that this is an arena in which people take sides, you know, and once they join their team, there isn't much that you can get them off the team. Uh, You you can get them to talk less, I suppose, and success would do that. So there's no substitute for winning, right? If, If President Trump does well, if, if things go well, the economy does well, ISIS stays you know, beaten back as they are. If North Korea, we find some, some reasonable s- solution there, which would be hard, uh, people are gonna forget all that. And they're just gonna reinterpret their, their impression of what, what they saw in the past. Okay, <clears throat> Democrats who are not only uniform in denouncing President Trump, but seem completely fixated <laughs> on getting him out of office, removing him from office. And even, it seems to me, I could be wrong about this, but it seems to me that there's not much policy work being done. There's not, there's just nothing happening on the Democratic Party except denunciations of President Trump. Your advice for the Nancy Pelosi's and the Maxine Waters's of the world? So, it seems to be true that whichever party is out of power, is the ridiculous one. And, but there's a reason for that. I mean, there's a perfectly logical reason. When Obama was in power, it seemed like the right was ridiculous. It's like, yes. hey, what about your birth certificate? And, you know, are right. you a secret Muslim? And so, and it just, it looked ridiculous. crazy. Right. It just looked crazy. Um, and the people out of power, the last thing they want to do is put forward a positive proposal. Because first of all, it's not going to happen because they're not in power. <laughs> you know, the other side isn't going to say, hey, that was a good idea. Well, We're just going to use that. your plan. <laughs> exactly, right. so, so it would be a waste of time. But also it gives targets to the other side. Right. You know, if they want to just criticize what's happening with the administration, they don't want to have their own target sitting there that they can fire back. So I think that's just the state of politics is that the, the party out of power is going to look crazy. And you know, confirmation bias and cognitive dissonance and all that stuff is going to be swirling around whichever side is out of power. And it's just going to look crazy. Okay. The press. Here's journalist Carl Bernstein of Watergate fame. Quote, we are in the midst of a malignant presidency. It calls on our journalists to do a different kind of reporting. (laughs) Close quote. And that's, you get a lot of that in the mainstream media. This guy is so bad. This is such uncharted territory for Americans that we have to be advocacy journalism. We've got to let Americans know how, what a catastrophe he is. Your advice to the press. Keep in mind that the advocates are just advocates. And therefore, there's nothing that they say that can be taken with any 
form of credibility. In other words, they don't even necessarily believe what they're saying. Some of them probably do. But I think they're, as soon as you say, I'm on this team and you know, I'm gonna fight to the death, uh, there, there's no sense of credibility with any of those folks. Okay, and now, your advice for Donald J. Trump himself. He's got an impressive talent stack, you've convinced me of that, but he's also stuck at 40% in the polls. That's where they've peaked. Who knows where he is today, maybe 36%, something like that. Um, would you keep him from tweeting if you could? Uh, no way, tweeting has won him the presidency. It connects him to the people. It makes the people who, who love him, love him more. He is entertaining. He has, he has made all of us learn more about politics, the law, um, really just how the world works. We have learned so much. And a lot of it that is his direct you know, contact with the people, unfiltered, the warts and all. Um, I would take you back a couple of years uh, during the campaign when people said, the one thing we know for sure about Trump is that with this low popularity, mm -hmm. he can never win the presidency. I said, no, you're missing the other way you win the presidency. You don't have to outrun the bear. You have to only outrun your camping buddy. So if he can make Hillary Clinton look worse than he looks, doesn't matter how low his number is. He could be a 10 if she's a five. What happened? He made her look worse. Because he is the best brander, best influencer, best persuader I've ever seen. All right? You know, Lion Ted, Low Energy Jeb, <laughs> Crooked Hillary. These are not random insults. You saw the other side. Low, en low Energy Jeb ended Jeb Bush's campaign. Which I predicted the day, the day I heard it. I said that publicly it's the end of him, when nobody was saying that. Oh. And the reason is, the, his linguistic kill shots, as I call them, are not random. He first of all picks something that fix, uh, fits their physicality. In other words, there's a visual element to it. Right. And the visual is the most persuasive of, of all, right? It's the senses, it's the one sense that just overrides all your other stuff. And as soon as I heard that, I said to myself, before I heard that, my impression of Jeb Bush was this is a cool, calm, executive, you know, this guy is gonna be the perfect guy. If, there's, like, like if there's war, yeah. he's not gonna get to, you know, out of control. The moment I heard low energy, I couldn't see him any other way. Because, and then every time I saw him, he, he, the contrast with uh, Trump's high energy just made it all the more damning. And by the way, contrast is an enormous thing in persuasion. So it's not enough to say, I'm high energy, I'm high energy. You gotta say, and I'm competing against low energy, Jeb? Right. That's just deadly, he, okay. he was done on that day. Scott, a couple of last questions. And one question is, why do you do what you do? You live in Northern California where your views are intensely unpopular. And so why do you blog the way you blog? And I think I figured it out. You write Dilbert for ordinary Americans. You came from a small town in upstate New York. And yes, you got out as fast as you could. You flew to California right away after graduating from college. Still in your mind, I think you're a kid from upstate New York. And you don't like getting pushed around. You don't like deferring <laughs> to experts or authority. And so I think that in some basic way, you are as much of a champion of ordinary overlooked Americans as is Donald Trump. Um, I, I love your version of it, but let me, <laughs> let, let, let me, let me put it in, in my words. I, I like to describe a perfect life this way. We're born as selfish. The baby can't do anything, right? You have to do something for it. Kids, still selfish, but they're learning to do a few things, maybe some uh, errands, some chores. By the time you're, you've got your own kids, you've changed a little bit. You're, you're giving more than you're taking, but right. you're somewhere in the middle. And by the time you're my age, if you've done everything right, you have enough for yourself. You've done what you need to do. And finally, you can be mostly a giver. Right, so that was always the life arc that I've pursued. Start perfectly selfish, and on your last day, give it all away. Literally, you die, your estate's gone. And by then, you should have given all of your wisdom, any, any kindness you had, any, anything you could contribute. So I'm at that stage in my life where that means more to me than money, because I have money, and I have unusually good health, you know, for my age and everything. Uh, and 
it, this is how I can give back. When, when uh, Trump came on the scene, what I wrote long before he made a dent in the election, when people still thought he was a joke, I said, not only is he going to win at all, but he's going to put a hole in the universe. He's going to change everything about the way you think of your human condition and the way you understand your reality. And I thought, if I'm not explaining this as it happens, because there weren't too many people who could sort of see it from this perspective, it could be chaos. <laughs> it, could, it could be there could be riots in the streets, which there almost were. But um, when you start seeing this in the, through the filter of persuasion, it makes you feel comfortable that he knows what he's doing, even when he departs from the fact checkers. You know, he says fact checking works for you, but I can make it work without that, <laughs> and it's completely well, intentional. Here's a last question: <clears throat> President Trump in Warsaw earlier this month, quote, the fundamental question of our time is whether the West has the will to survive. Do we have the confidence in our values to defend them? Do we have the desire and the courage to preserve our civilization in the face of those who would subvert and destroy it? Close quote. You and I grew up a couple of counties apart in upstate New York. We're within a couple of months of the same age. And what I know about that is it means you can remember the 80s and you can remember the Reagan years, the economy revived, the re country recovered its morale. People mm -hmm. of our age can actually remember what that felt like. And the West won the Cold War. Will the Trump years represent something like that, some kind of national renewal? Uh, as I predicted that he would win when nobody thought he would, uh, I also predict that he has at least a very high potential to do things in his term the likes of which we haven't seen. For example, I don't think anybody else could solve North Korea. I think he can. Now, I'm, I'm going to stop short of saying he can do it because it's so monstrously difficult, but I think he has the skill set. Like, you know, you saw the way, the way he was uh, dealing with China, you know, because China has to be part of this. He said, hey, China's great. You know, you guys, this is your problem in your own backyard. See if you can take care of it. Well, you tried. <laughs> right. look, look at the level of persuasion that is. You know, people thought, well, it's just a cute tweet, he's just being folksy and stuff. But the way that paints this picture, it makes China kind of need to step up to the, step up to the plate, because what, what he said is, is that you're, you're sort of not the superpower you want to be. Right. He basically has challenged them to be the country that they want to be. That's the key. That's how persuasion works. Don't tell somebody to be the way you want them to be. Say, look, if you want to be the way you want to be, here's how to get there. That's very persuasive. Scott Adams, creator of Dilbert, author of many books, including How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Big. Thank you. Thank you. And while the camera is still rolling, you have a new book coming out in? October, end of October. Entitled How to Win Huge, How to Win Bigly. No, it's just Win Bigly. Win Bigly. Win Bigly. All right. Keeping it simple. We'll do a, a, a show on Win Bigly. I'd love to. Excellent. For Uncommon Knowledge and the Hoover Institution, I'm Peter Robinson.